So you start by thanking the local organizers and the organizers on the other side of the world for the opportunity to speak here and in China and in Japan all at the same time. It's a really unique experience. Um, so as uh, Ahmed said, I'm going to be talking about some uh, theory of motivic cohomology of formal schemes in characteristic P. So perhaps no. we'll... Le tableau ne doit pas bouger. Ah, il est derrière. Ah oui, parce que c'est pré-enregistré. Est-ce que vous pouvez utiliser les échanger, mais ce truc-là, il n'a pas là-bas. Donc si tu le déplaces en haut. Ah, enfin. Ça commence. Ah, tu peux ça. Ah, so the goal, more precisely, will be to discuss some definitions of continuous motivic cohomology. And this continuous is probably important because one can imagine very non-continuous variants of the theory and ask how they compare. Um, so that won't be the focus today. Uh, this motivic cohomology will be closely related to some continuous K theory of these formal schemes. But the purpose is not just so much to offer these uh, equivalent definitions, but rather to derive some nice applications from the equivalences involved in the definition. So let me start by setting up then a little bit of the notation we'll use. So my rings. Everything's going to be in characteristic P today. So let's say everything's characteristic P. Uh, everything will be in Ethereum. And even more, everything is going to be so called F finite. So we say the ring is F finite. Precisely when it's finitely generated over its subring of p powers. It says it has a finite p basis essentially. But it doesn't need to be a basis. Yeah. It just needs to be finitely generated. Uh, so, for example, most of the time you can just assume that we've got some. Uh, uh, Variety over a field with a finite p basis. Uh, but what's important is that you could also take the completion of such a variety along some uh, some subscheme. And in fact, that's really the reason that it's convenient to work with these two general hypotheses. One needs to reduce certain calculations for the case of uh, complete local rings, which are of course not treated by uh, the classical results concerning finite type parameters over fields. So I can move this up here. But now they can't see that, right? Yeah, yeah, but we have we can reach out. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, I think I got the hang of this. Okay. Uh, so in such a situation, we're going to be considering the wick ring. Uh, this is the usual p-typical wick vectors, and the round which sheaves, as usual. Uh, these will usually be in the Tau topology, but uh, we can move them where we like. Why don't we continue here then to make the video easier, I suppose. Uh, so let me now explain then, now with this basic setup, how we can define motivic cohomology of a usual smooth variety in about five equivalent ways. Uh, 
Ah. Because they are Doran git chips, you assume that git is smooth, so maybe not. No, in fact, in the moment, X is going to be some thickened subscheme of definition of a formal scheme. But let's now suppose that X really is a smooth, to view what's true classically, let's suppose that X is a smooth variety. Over some perfect field of characteristic B. Then we can define It's a tau, so I'm going to be interested primarily today in a tau motivic cohomology, but uh, most of what I'm going to say works verbatim if you want to define usual Zariski motivic cohomology or even something using this Nevich topology in between. But for the applications, it's more useful to consider it from the point of view of the tau topology. So let me say that we can define the tau motivic cohomology. Um, so this is sometimes called the Lichtenbaum cohomology. H star, oh, I don't really have a standard subscript, it's like a motivic etal, something like that. And coefficients, so I'm only going to be considering periodically because that's the, really the interesting case uh, for some variety in characteristic P. So I can sort of finite coefficients, weight n, like this. So as I say, this can be defined uh, to be the correctly shifted etal cohomology on X of any of the following, and I'll present you with a bunch of isomorphic with fields which are now known to be isomorphic and hence provide uh, equivalent definitions of the motor cohomology. So we can firstly, so I can look a little bit like that looks okay. The most explicit definition is that we take the etal cohomology of the logarithmic Hodge width sheaves sitting inside the Durand width sheaves. So these are these WR omega x log n. As I say, by definition, the etal. Ah, so as alternative notation, this is sometimes written as a new maybe sub r brackets n sub x, where one puts the r, the n, and the x seems to have uh, evolved in the literature, so I'll use uh, this notation instead. So this is the tau subsheaf of the Durand width sheaf, wr omega x n n, generated locally by the log forms, that is to say, the log of some type monolith F1 multiplied together through d log some type monolith Fn. Or more succinctly, uh, which I write really just as a convenient opportunity to introduce this d log map, I mean to say this is the image in the etal topology of this d log map from Gmx Living the etal topology to make things clear, n times to the Durand width sheaf. And as I already mentioned, these usually go under the name logarithmic Hodge width sheaf. And I wanted to attach some names to it. Maybe I can just squeeze them in at the bottom. Uh, so this was some extent, this was a classical definition of a tau motivic cohomology that was considered before motivic cohomology existed. Um, so and I this think, is. I think that Cato suggested this should be included. Uh, exactly. So the names I was going to include are precisely Cato, Milne, 
and the Politan bound. I don't know how the independence works, perhaps Carter and Lichtenbaum independently suggested it might be the right uh, definition, because Carter in general, Lichtenbaum was more interested in uh, special values of zeta functions for smooth projective varieties of a finite field. He proposed that these values should be detected by this cohomology theory, and Milne developed this theory to some extent. Others could be included, but at least with those three. So as I say, that's somehow the, a classical definition of the Piatic automata of cohomology in characteristic P, that doesn't require you to know anything about motivic cohomology. So an alternative definition then is I can instead of taking the cohomology of these logarithmic hard width sheaves, I can take the cohomology of some Milner K theory sheaves. Uh, so this is by definition, I take gm, x, again, n copies, let me not worry too much about the topology, um, that will probably be in the Italian topology for most of today, and I kill the relation that some symbol f1 to fn is zero, whenever there exists some indices i not equal to j, for which fi plus fj is one. So it's classical Milner K theory sheaf, on y, and the, the log map from gmn to uh, the Hardwood sheet factors then through Milner K theory. So I can draw, so I want to have just a little bit of this on the board, as this disappeared. Factors like so. Thank you. Uh, instead of Milner K theory, we can also consider Quillen K theory. Let me just call that KNX. And this is the end. Quillen K theory sheet, uh, which I won't define. Let me just remark that we have then the natural map from Milner K theory to Quillen K theory, and that uh, if I'm in the case, for example, n equals 1, which will interest us in particular, then everything degenerates to gm. And also for k2. Sorry? Also k2 are equal. That's true, but the, then the next statement that my gm, uh, that won't be true. What? Oh, I'm going to do it, uh, yeah, so as Arthur was saying, it's also the case that the, that the, that the Milner and the Quillen K theory coincide in degree 2 as well. And uh, maybe for experts, maybe the only expert is in fact Arthur, uh, this would really be improved Milner K theory in the case in which I had, uh, in the case in which I was working with a smooth variety of the finite field. Otherwise, there could be some, okay, no, some small problem. And, the, and, then, uh, and then some people studied. Proved it in characteristic P does are quite close. I mean, so Levine and Yeah, yeah, that's what's going to come. That's exactly what leads to these equivalences of the different definitions. Yeah. It will turn out then to, to flesh out his comment that since we're on a smooth variety of characteristic P, modular any power of P, one knows that the Milner and the Quillen K theory actually coincide. That's what we'll see in a moment. Uh, so, as I started out by saying, the logarithmic hodge which sheaf is in some sense the, the most naive definition that you can give even without knowing anything about motivic cohomology. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, some general definition that you can take the uh, correct weight and correct uh, shift of the Vyvodsky's motivic complex. I better take it more P to the R. And let me then add one more to the list. So if n equals 1, um, this is perhaps most closely tied to the old part of the story involving uh, Milne and Lichtenbaum's study of the logarithmic hodge witch sheaf. They also considered the cohomology of the p power roots of unity sheaf in the flat topology. And it's known that it's then equivalent. So if n equals 1, I can add to this list of isomorphic sheaves. Oh, well, now I get a complex of sheaves. The uh, derived direct image of mu p to the r 
where I'm pushing forwards from a flat topology down to the tail topology. So up and I shift it uh, with a minus one. I think if I want to coincide with my indexing, yeah. So that means I'm looking at H with the degree matching the usual in the motivic cohomology. Yes. So can I use, no, because then I cover up my screen. I want a new board. Okay, but I shouldn't move to the other side. No, no. Okay. Okay, so right up. Okay, so we now have on the boards, uh, for example, we have four or five then possible definitions of the material homology of a smooth variety in characteristic P. Okay, and also you have to take the Miller and the Quillen modulo powers of P. Oh, sorry, did I forget to? Ah, yeah, sorry. Um, and also, yeah, and also thank you. I saying it can take modulo power of P just in a naive sense, or in a derived sense, but in fact the kernel is zero. So. Yeah, in fact the kernel is zero, yeah. No, that, the first comment there is an important question. The Milner and the Quillen Cater sheet should of course be taking modular P to the R if I want to define that. Then we should be called with coefficients mod P to the R. So as I say, these are all isomorphic. Let's start with the case when n equals 1. No, okay, stop there. I just want to say by. Uh, so y, so one firstly uses a... Uh, Let me call it a fundamental exact sequence due to inner z, stating that the sequence of sheaves given by 0 goes to gm goes to gm by raising to the p to the r goes via the d log of a type monolith to WR omega x1 log is exact. And one combines this uh, with a result from Grotendieck's study of the cohomological Brouwer group. which tells us that this derived direct image of GM in the FPPF topology is nothing other than GM in the Italian topology. Did I want to add one more? And maybe we add to the list three Vyvotsky's identification of uh, Z1, white one, being nothing other than GM. And so if you combine uh, 1, 2, and 3, you can easily check that when n equals 1, all these possible definitions of the weight one, periodic, tau, motivic cohomology, are the same. Um, the Milne and the Quillen K theory definitions already coincide because everything collapses to GM. Then Vygotsky's general definition just collapses to some uh, GM mod P to the R, but we see from Z sequence that GM mod P to the R is nothing other than the logarithmic Hodge-Witt sheaf. And then you easily extract from uh, 
Growth index result on the direct image of GM and the FPPF topology, a similar result for the p power group of unity sheaf in the FPPF topology, which again tells you uh, that the FPPF definition of periodic motivic cohomology will just collapse to the cohomology of the logarithmic Hodgewitz sheaf. And in the end, everything collapses to the same definition. Okay. The situation then for higher weight motivic cohomology is rather more complicated. I will try to get the history completely uh, correct here. Let me say that again, the shoes are all isomorphic in positive weights by results of. I'm going to try to get the chronological order right. We have the block Carter Gamba theorem. We have this Bolden's result that the normal K theory of fields in characteristic P have no P torsion. Um, then perhaps Gu and Suwa who established uh, Gersten resolutions for logarithmic hard sheaves that you deduce results for logarithmic k to width hard sheaves from, uh, from their values of fields. Combine that then with block cut or gather to get information about Milner k-theory sheaves in terms of logarithmic hard sheaves through the field case. Um, Kurtz's resolution of Gersten conjecture from Milner k-theory and then Geiser Levine, and finally Albert Vincent with Muller Stark. So, anyway, this list of names is perhaps for the experts, but if you add together everything they've done, you uh, can deduce in quite a straightforward way, though it's, it's actually hard to find these precise statements in the literature that, firstly, one has a generalization of this fundamental exact sequence of it or z, but now from Milner K theory in higher degrees, stating, I write it in exactly the same way, as I said, that the exact analogous sequence is indeed exact. So that is to say that the normal K-theory sheaves have no torsion, and that the, uh, I know the kernel of the log map is exactly the multiples, P to the R. Sorry, I think it's too much. And then what you can deduce mainly using the results of Geisel and Levine, as I've already mentioned, is that mod p to the r, the Quillen and the Milmore k theory sheaves coincide. Moreover, uh, we can identify the Milmore k theory mod p to the r with Vygotsky's motivic complex mod p to the r. Yes, this so this is Geisel Levine. This is Geisel Levine. Yeah, uh, it's Geisel Levine plus Gerson conjecture. You use it in the case of field and then Geisel Levine put up in the case of field. Yeah. So as I say, it's uh, as I say, one struggles to have exactly find statements for one part in literature, but the. Well, this is a straightforward quality of assembling of all the hard work that people have done. Um, and so you get from that to um, that then even in weight and bigger than one, all these equivalent, all these possible definitions of the periodic motivic cohomology of a smooth dividing characteristic P will again be the same.
And so the goal of the main theorem that I want to say something about today is to extend this identification of possible uh, definitions of characteristic homology and characteristic P from the setting of smooth varieties to the setting of regular formal schemes. Before which I should perhaps remark that um, these various isomorphisms of to a smooth variety would fail as soon as X is non-smooth. Um, but of course, it, I, could be, it could be regular because the like, Pesco theorem has a limit of smooth things, and I can quite easily. It will be true for regular. Yeah. yeah. So in fact, if I take X to be any yeah. any regular FP scheme, then the statements remain true. Yes, yeah, this is true. But I would guess if I insert any even very mild singularity into X, they fail to be true. And in particular, if I make X non-reduced, then they will definitely fail to be true. And what we're going to see in a moment, though, is if I take a formal scheme and I consider what happens for all subschemes of definition, then although for any fixed subscheme of definition, all these isomorphisms will fail, then they'll somehow hold in the limit. In the derived sense, is it okay? You mean I take some hypercover by smooth varieties? I think this will then depend on the sense including derived geometry. I think if you interpreted it to mean that I start by replacing my singular variety by some smooth hypercover, then it's not tautologically true. Mm -hmm. You can derive. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, the idea yeah. that you use a ring, uh, you make a simplicial resolution by smooth. smooth, and then you apply the theory for those. And then you get something. You get something, it's not clear what you get. But then you, can but you get something. <laughs> but then you can prove it's independent, like for the cotangent problem. Sure. You start proving sure. it's independent of the resolutions, things like that. But then the, 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 the key maybe is different. The key The key groups will change, yes. Yeah. So it's not known what you get. But I think it's not known what you get. Hmm. Yeah. No, something to look at. So let's say this main theorem that I want to discuss is an analog of these identifications for formal schemes. So let me take Y to be regular formal FP scheme uh, Y1 some subscheme of definition So do I keep going too far on that? I think okay. I take y1 to be some subscheme of definition, and then I'll write uh, y sub s to mean the f infinitesimal thickening of y1. So it's defined by the s power or the s plus first power. This is a well, I want the notation to be consistent. Oh, it depends. What is the first infinitesimal? Yeah, it's, it's in the literature, sometimes you take the n plus first. And I want y1 to equal y1. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so with this convention. <laughs> I think that's a good convention. No, well, okay, I see the possible ambiguity. The first infinitesimal thickening could mean I... Okay, for me, the first infinitesimal thickening means no thickening. Which is maybe not a good convention. Okay, so if I make it s minus 1. <laughs> so what about this? Okay, I want y1 to be y1, just to, do to keep the notation sensible. So then the statement Yeah, I stopped there. No, they just need to keep going. Uh, 
only a little bit. Uh, so then uh, we're going to assemble together the following possible definitions of the periodic motivic homology for each infinitesimal thickening of this subscheme of definition to get some pro et al sheaf on uh, the formal scheme or equivalently on any of these subschemes of definition. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. I put the hyphen in the wrong place. I mean, it's a. It's not the sheaf for the pro et al. No, that's why I'm trying to get this hyphen right because it's. It's a pro open bracket et al sheaf. Yeah, this is a problem that we now have. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's also true in the other way. Hmm? Maybe it's also true. First we write the poem. First we write the poem. Okay, it'll be clear once it's written. So let me write it all down and then pause it a little bit. Okay, so let me explain what's going on now that it's all on the board. So for each of these infinitesimal thickenings, I can consider the previous definitions of the periodic motivic cohomology, which work for a smooth variety. I can consider for, as I say, for each S minus first infinitesimal thickening, I can consider the logarithmic hog width sheaf on Y sub S, or I can consider the Milner K theory sheaf on Y sub S, or I can consider the Quillen K theory sheaf on Y sub S, or if N equals one, I can consider this higher direct image from the FPPF topology on Y sub S of the P to the R uh, power root of the unity sheaf. And here R is fixed. So maybe we've written that. And so let me first uh, emphasize the point that for any fixed infinitesimal thickening, that is to say for any fixed S, I think none of these maps will be isomorphisms. Absolutely none. Except if uh, S equals 1 and Y1 is smooth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, my YS, it has some nilpotent uh, stuff, and all the maps will fail to be isomorphisms. So the statement then is, however, as maps of pro sheaves, so that is to say, I neglect uh, Artin Reese zero systems, something called Mix Agletha zero systems, and I assemble them into pro sheaves over all of the infinitesimal thickenings. I do get isomorphisms of proteins. At least, maybe under some mild hypothesis, which uh, in practice is satisfied. Uh, so, In the case n equals 1, uh, there's no additional hypothesis. <coughs> in the case in which we're in weight strictly bigger than 1, we need to assume that y1, well, the, the underlying reduced subscheme of this subscheme of definition, is not too singular. So what can this mean? Um, uh, certainly if it's regular then there's no problem. Regular things are not too singular. But it could also be uh, it could be for example uh, simple normal crossing divisors. So I could have started with some smooth variety, 
and taking its completion along a simple normal crossing divisor, and take this as my subscheme of definition. This is also allowed. In fact, all that's required is that uh, y1 is somehow a generalized, I don't think there's a piece of terminology for this, I want to assume that I can cover, I want to assume that the irreducible, that the reduced irreducible components of y1 are regular, and that any of the reduced intersections is also regular. Any intersection or the, the only intersection with the reduced structure? The intersections with the reduced structure. Ah, so you can have arbitrary, so, okay, so they can contact, you can have contact between, so you can have several regular things with some contacts, are you okay? Yeah, as long as the intersections are themselves regular with their reduced subscheme structure. Yeah, it looks, it looks, Ah, this is just because the method uses certain computations which you cannot generalize to the... It's not exactly for computations, it's because one needs to be able to decompose the study of the K theory of this subscheme of definition into the behavior on each of the irreducible components. And in order to be able to do that, you need some uh, excision techniques in K theory which only work when you have some sufficient regular conditions. So it might not even be true when you have a very non-regular subscheme of definition. And look smooth? I don't know. I think K-tube log schemes is not very well understood, so... So by the way, so the comparison of Milner and logarithmic derived, if you are just doing it for the Epal topology, it is simpler than the block cartographer. So one can give more or less a more comp a much easier proof well, I don't know in your case, but it seems that uh, it should be possible to... Well, it's not written down, so anyway, but it's, uh, it's, it's, in, but it's, just, it's easier, so it's just doing it for separately closed field, which is... So even the generation was pulled by cut Yeah, and, yeah. But then one can work on the... One can uh, build on this and do some... But I will not... Uh, 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 in any case... Yeah, so I think that uh, at least the, without the equivalent part, it should be possible to, to do it uh, without the assumption. Uh, but that would be good. I mean, why don't we discuss that? Because actually, it's the, it's the Milner K theory part which causes the most trouble. We now have good techniques for the study of Quillen K theory. So in fact, the way that the theorem is found, I'm even lying a little bit, um, in that this isomorphism I can't establish in quite the full generality that I have written down. Um, but that isomorphism I can. So one directly constructs an isomorphism between the Quillen K theory and the logarithmic hard Ritchie, and then the Milner K theory is sitting in between, but there could be some very slight difference, which is the same difference from both arrows. Um, so any direct technique to actually study the normal case in this sort of messy situation would be very useful. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Um, so the conclusion of this then uh, is that we can use any of these three or four definitions to define the, the Lipton bound motivic cohomology of a formal scheme and characteristic P or a sufficiently regular formal scheme and characteristic P. Are they? Are they? So as I said, the conclusion of this is that uh, we may then just define H star Motivic et al. of this formal scheme with C mod P to the R coefficients in weight N uh, to be the correct shift of the continuous et al. cohomology on this subscheme of definition of any. of these pro et al. sheets. 
if I'm given some Perl sheaf, there are now maybe two or three ways uh, that I can make sense of its continuous, uh, um, continuous etal cohomology. And either you can take Janssen's original approach, or you can just take some derived limit of uh, the system of sheaves. Maybe some uh, more categorical approach. There are several ways. So in any case, the theorem tells you that any of these three or four sensible definitions of the continuous etal motor cohomology of a formal scheme in characteristic P under some mild regularity hypotheses coincide. So let me say just a few words about the proof of this theorem. But let me focus on the much more down-to-earth case at n equals 1. So I wonder if it's still there. Okay, so it's disappeared. Maybe people have it in their notes. Um, so the key to proving this when n equals 1 is an analog for formal schemes of what was the fundamental exact sequence of LOZ, which has now disappeared. In other words, that if I assemble together on my formal scheme, all of these GMs for all the infinitesimal thickenings, and I go by raising to the P to the R, to the GMs for all the infinitesimal thickenings, and I go by the delog map to the logarithmic hodge width sheaves in degree one of all of these infinitesimal thickenings, then I get an exact sequence of pro etale sheaves. Even though to emphasize again, for any fixed value of s, this will be non-exact. Uh, so, let me explain what the, the, the only non-trivial step is. I mean, the delog map is subjective by definition. There's nothing to do there. And one then uh, analyzes some filtration here, very similarly to what Illuzi did in the classical case of a smooth variety. And using that, you can, I mean, one really tries to follow Illuzi's proof as closely as you can. You reduce to the case in which r equals 1. You make the uh, banal observation that the log of something is zero, the log of some unit is zero, if and only d of it is zero. And so then you see that Exactly what you need to do is to prove a Cartier isomorphism for formal schemes in characteristic P. Stating that, uh, so I guess it's under these same conditions, I've got some regular formal FP scheme, I've got any subscheme of definition because I'm in the n equals 1 case, so no regularity hypotheses are required. Uh, and so you need to check then that uh, the inverse Cartier maps from the um, I mean, they said the ram width, and uh, too used to width things, um, from the, the ram sheaves or from the hodge sheaves to the cohomology of the ram complex. So we always have to find, even though the ys is a non regular, one does have inverse Cartier maps defined as so, and these are not isomorphisms because ys is very non smooth, and uh, 
the result states, however, that the inverse Cartier maps induce an isomorphism of prime sheaves when, as usual, I assemble everything over all infinitesimal thickens. And once you have that type of formal Cartier isomorphism, you can really mimic the original proof of Z to check that um, you get an exact sequence, and that precisely gives you the equivalences of the, the weight one case of the theorem. You will forget that uh, the you are omega one and y s log, uh, the core object is the same as the uh, W omega 1 Y S and how modulo P E R. Oh, I do. This was the hardest part actually. I'll mention this in a moment. This was the most painful part. In fact, you don't need this though in the weight one case of the theorem. You can avoid it there. So it only comes up when establishing the higher weight case. So when any when any any of them wants to emphasize against this gives some very uh, reasonably straightforward direct proof of the equivalences in the weight one case. Uh, I mean we can't hope for such a thing uh, when n is strictly greater than one because then you need to understand these uh, Quillen K theory sheaves on uh, all these thickened subschemes of definitions of the formal scheme, uh, where of course uh, one needs to use some methods from topological cyclic homology. the fact that topological cyclic homology is itself related to uh, certain Duran witch sheaves via a so called Hochschild constant Rosenberg theorems. You first to Hasselhalt, and then the variant that we need in this setting for formal schemes uh, was developed jointly with Bjorn Dundas and Bergen. Hasselhalt so to refer to topological. Sorry? When you mention Hasselhalt, it's because you are topological. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So the classical Hochschild constant Rosenberg theorem relates cyclic homology to Duran homology in the case of smooth, uh, smooth algebras. Usually over characteristic zero field, but that's not really necessary. And then for topological cyclic homology, the analogous result was established by Hesselhoff relating uh, certain pieces of the topological cyclic homology spectrum to uh, Duran witch sheaves. And then Bjorn and I established an analog of that for formal schemes. So again, if you try to compute the topological cyclic homology of all these types of thickenings of some subscheme of definition of a regular formal scheme, we managed to link that to the Duran witch sheaves of again all the infinitesimal thickenings of the subscheme of definition. And so that's then what provides the fundamental link between K theory of all these subschemes of definition and the Duran witch sheaves. And that's the sort of the starting point for the argument. And then once you've got it started, you need to how to put it, let me see. You pick up your well thumbed uh, copy of Ilaziz's treatise on the Duran Wick complex and you try to prove an analog of every single result for regular formal schemes, which is not always so easy. 
So I just want to mention one such result, and I say you want to extend basically any every result you can find about the random width sheaves and logarithmic and hard width sheaves. For smooth varieties, the formal scheme. The most tricky bit of which is just what you asked a moment ago, that if I try to increase the, uh, the level of my logarithmic hard width sheet, say from R to R prime, then I move over here, it takes up some space. Then I can consider the logarithmic hard width sheaf of all these y s's of level r prime, take it mod p to the r, compare it to the logarithmic hard width sheaf of level r on y s. And then for any fixed level of S, actually I don't know this. I think for any fixed level of S, this is not an isomorphism. But I don't have a counterexample. So Illusy proved this in the case in which my YS is a smooth variety. And what is at least good enough, and what already requires some amount of work, is that as proetal sheaves over all the infinitesimal thickenings, this is an isomorphism. That's actually really, that's a really essential step, because without that one gets some description of the pro systems of the k-theories of the y-s's modulo p to the s, as a pro system indexed diagonally over all the infinitesimal thickenings and over all the modulo p to the s's. If you get much weaker results that way, and you have to somehow cut down this study of the k-theory then to mod p to the r. And the key essential step in doing that is precisely that isomorphism. So you have two truncations, R and S. Yeah, and if you're not careful, you end up with two, you end up with various messy diagonal pro systems over both the indices at the same time. And you get results, but they're much less pleasing results. And then to cut it down to the way I've stated it, that's the key isomorphism. So you try again, you try to imitate what Lewis did, but there it doesn't really work. There you have to do some extra work. Um, so let me, so that's the end of the sketch of the, of the proof of these equivalences. And one can now ask, what's the point of the conclusion? Why do I want to write down a definition of uh, continuous periodic material cohomology of formal schemes in characteristic P? And the answer is perhaps that I don't really. What I want to know, though, is that these previous definitions are equivalent because, uh, well, I won't point because it won't be on the camera. Um, the K theory controls certain problems, cons controls certain deformation and cycle theoretic problems, and the logarithmic Hodge Witt sheaves, uh, well, they really do control some Lichtenbaum Brown uh, motivic homology which is floating around. So having a relation between them leads to some nice applications. Which is what I will mention uh, to finish. So I'll try to present two, they won't take long. So the first of these is weak left sets for channel groups. So let's suppose that X is a smooth variety Of a perfect field characteristic P as usual. In fact, it's even going to be a smooth projective variety, excuse me. Uh, y into X is some smooth ample divisor, let's say hyperplane section. And I 
take n to be at most half the dimension of y. So then I can consider chow loop co-dimension n cycles on x, chow loop co-dimension n cycles on y, uh, consider this restriction, and this is conjecturally an isomorphism after tensoring by q. That's exactly this weak left that's conjectural. For child groups. Uh, so this no one can prove at the moment. So what we do is to make our life a little bit easier, we use the block coolant formula to identify child group co-dimension n cycles with the n risky cohomology on y of well, let's take normal k theory just for the sake of comfort. Um, of the nth k theory sheaf. We do the same for x. And that then permits us to factor this restriction map from cycles on x to cycles on the hyperplane section through some uh, type of chow group of the formal completion of x along this hyperplane section. Uh, just introduce this as some temporary notation, it's not supposed to have too much meaning, um, which is by definition the limit of what we would get from the block coolant formula. So it's a cohomological chow group um, of this formal scheme. So take the limit over the cohomology on all these. The yss are again the infinitesimal thickenings of my hyperplane section inside x, and I take all of the cohomological chow groups. You can also take the continuous cohomology. I can also take continuous cohomology, and the result will be the same. Okay. Uh, yeah, the result will be the same. The result will be the same. Uh, so now I can factor this restriction map that we want to prove as an isomorphism, but which we can't prove as an isomorphism. And application one rather states that this is an isomorphism. Up to bounded P torsion. P power torsion. So this is the sort of result which is now going under the name of infinitesimal part of the weak left shirts conjecture for chat groups. So say the ultimate goal is to prove weak left shirts, and then it's cycles on x the same as cycles on y, uh, but in fact what we can prove is that cycles on the formal completion of x along y are the same as cycles on y. And then to prove four weak left shirts, you have to prove the so-called algebraization part of the assertion, namely that cycles on x identify with cycles on the formal completion. And that's what seems to be out of reach using current techniques. Do I have two minutes or? Okay. So then what I wrap out, let me just say a brief word about the proof. Um, the first step is to check that everything I said in the main theorem continues to hold in some suitable sense for the Zariski topology. You see my child groups here always defined in terms of Zariski cohomology of k theory. So first thing you should check some analog of the main term in the Zariski topology, where the difficulty is knowing whether the logarithmic Hodge-Witt sheaves are generated Zariski locally by d log forms. And so one proves that, in fact, one proves a very general result that logarithmic Hodge-Witt sheaves on an arbitrary FP scheme are always generated Zariski locally by d log forms. Which seems to be new, but uh, interested to have the. Ah, I think it was known to offer. Well, maybe it's new to everyone else then. I didn't know that. 
under not, not in your definition. So uh, I also had in the case that there is a p basis. Yes. So with before Gerson conjecture. Yes. It was it, I think I had a proof for rings with a p basis in the strong sense and and the uh, local let's say with infinite residue field of the, so a proof of the block gab gabber cut or without Gerson that is avoiding the so this was in the 80s so I had, okay. I had this okay so uh, and uh, on the other hand in your definition I don't know the so you claim that when you do like this you define it as a tall ships and then take sections over the risky local ring yes. of this tall ships and this is locally generated by this is generated by symbols yes I didn't think about this. Uh, okay. That's what seems to be true. So it seems to be true. And then unless you extend the previous term into the Zariski topology, and so then this assertion about some isomorphism uh, between the Zariski cohomology of K sheaves and the Zariski cohomology, uh, excuse me, it's isomorphism between the Zariski cohomology of K sheaves reduces to some similar isomorphism about cohomology of certain logarithmic hard width sheaves. And you can even, you can again, by some, then apply some Bayes and Lichtenbaum type trick to pass between Zariski and Atal topologies. And so it then reduces to establishing <laughs> some isomorphism between a tau cohomology of logarithmic Hodge-Witt sheaves, for which you can use uh, the known weak left sheds in crystalline cohomology, identifying. So first, you need some algebraization trick to identify then uh, this type of object with a cohomology sheaf on X, which won't be true for K theory, but which will be true for certain logarithmic Hodge-Witt sheaves. And then the two pieces you obtain are isomorphic to certain uh, Frobenius eigenspaces inside the crystalline cohomology of X and the crystalline cohomology of Y, and these will be isomorphic by uh, the usual weak sets for crystalline cohomology. But you're not modding by powers of P in this. Ah, uh, uh, so no, that's okay. That's okay. I thought I made a mistake, but I haven't. What? That's right. So then you also need to assemble uh, all of these logarithmic hard riches not only into some limit in the S direction, but also some limit in the R direction, which takes account then of more and more of the difference between these two uh, k theory constructions. No, but the, your results are about the mean of k theory modulo powers of P. Correct. And but the difference between these two sheaves is entirely uh, P power torsion. Ah, but then you also need to control the kernel of P on those things. Yes. I think I'd better finish there and I can explain the second application to anyone who cares in private. Thank you very much. So maybe we take a few questions from Tokyo and then Beijing and then Paris. Are there some more questions? So, so you. So your scheme, formal scheme is over FP, but uh, can you study a uh, mixed stochastic case for to, to compare Milena case theory and Kinesis case theory? Yeah, the mixed characteristic case is very interesting, but I can't say anything concrete at the moment. Um, ideally, some similar theory should be possible in mixed characteristic as some uh, perhaps synthesis of what um, um, Block and O'Kerks did in the mixed characteristic case, together with this uh, recent work with, uh, with Bat and Schultzer. So now putting these two things together should get some good control in relation between the, the Quillen and the Milner K theory uh, in the mixed characteristic setting. But there's no, nothing concrete at the moment. Mm. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, in, in the case of formal uh, spec formal or formal power series, do you have a concrete description of the Rambit C? Sorry, I don't think I understood the question. Uh, in the case of formal uh, spec formal scheme of, of formal power series. Over a formal power series ring, or just like spur of a formal power series ring? Yes. Super spec of formal power series, yeah. Do you have the concrete description of the drum bit sheaf? Well, in that case, I mean, the logarithmic hardware sheaf system. could be written down very concretely, yes. Uh, and you mentioned the formal Cartier isomorphism. Yes. And uh, can, can one expect the existence of some uh, non-Adelian Hodge theory for formal scheme? 
Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Which case is it? What was the question? He wants a non abelian uh, Hodge theory. Hodge theory. Oh, oh, that's more about Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. We could put this question for the second one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's indeed the correct answer, isn't it? You just stay online for another hour and then. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from the view? Any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, can you uh, can you consider weak reflection theorem for a uh, child group with modulus? Ah, modulus. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone likes modulus. Uh, I mean, we already have some weak left set seven for child groups, with not And I see. Yes, I don't see. See why not? It seems to me the technique should generalize to the case of. I suppose you want to take some closed subscheme of y and examine some child group of modulus on y relative to some thickening of the divisor sitting on y. And then it seems to me that analogous results could be proved, yes. But again, they be of this type of infinitesimal nature. Are there any more questions? Yeah, thank you. That's it for me, Tokyo. Thank you. Then we go to Eugene. Are there any questions in Eugene? Ah, he's a new one. Okay. Great. So, uh, is there any analog of the Wojewski complex in the formal case? Well, <laughs> you can just define one using the theorem. I mean, you can, in some formal <laughs> sense, just by some cone construction, glue them. I mean, let's assume that the subscheme of definition is regular. Even let's assume that the subscheme of definition is smooth. Let's assume we've completed some smooth variety along a smooth subvariety. Then I have uh, Vygotsky's motivic complex sitting on this uh, subscheme of definition, which just by some formal cone construction, I can glue with any of the isomorphic pro sheaves. And that then gives me some type of pro motivic complex on the subscheme of definition. Um, for which the associated Piatic cohomology is exactly what I've been writing down, and for which the associated aladic motivic cohomology would just collapse to the aladic motivic cohomology of the original subscheme of definition. So the answer is yes, you can define some type of pro motivic complex, but it doesn't give you anything more than the piatic cohomology theory that I've been writing down and the original motivic cohomology of the subscheme of definition. Okay, thank you. Other questions from Beijing? No more questions from Beijing. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there any questions in class? There is a small question in the, the, the second application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind of you. Uh, so, the second application was going to be some, to some. Uh, in fact, the second application involves Chagum to modulus, so I hope Tokyo is still online. <laughs> Uh, so the second <laughs> application uh, is to some conjecture of Kato and Shuji Saito. I think this goes back to 1986. And so the motivation for this is that if X is a smooth variety, well, let's take my usual setup of a perfect field of characteristic P, though. It's not really necessary. Um, then you deduce 
either from the Gers either from Gerson's conjecture for K theory or from uh, some homotopy invariance results. that you can compute, well, the, the, the Zawiski cohomology of K-theory and the Nisnevich cohomology of K-theory are the same. So if I simplify K-theory and either the Zawiski or Nisnevich topology, and then I uh, compute the cohomology, I, I get the same thing. This is Miss Nevich. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so then. Carl and Simon made a conjecture that if I take some, let's say, simple normal crossing divisor, and then I can try to do something similar. Uh, concerning some uh, k-groups with modulus or relative k-groups in which I look at well they were maybe only interested in the case of the dimension of the variety so I can look at the relative k-theory sheaf of x relative to some thickening of y and I can again compare that to the Nisnevich cohomology, well, I guess my T should be N. And you could naively ask so, having now uh, modified K theory by some infinitesimal thickening along this simple normal crossing divisor, whether the same result is true. And maybe now that's conjectured, in fact, to be true as part of this development of reciprocity. Uh, Pre-sheaves by uh, Karl and Saito and Yamazaki, but what they conjectured in '86 was that at least after taking the limit over <coughs> the thickenings, then this should be true. The motivation for which, because it uh, requires some motivation to understand what's going on here, uh, so at the time they were studying high dimensional class field theory and they wanted to propose the left-hand side, if I understand the history correctly, as the definition of a higher dimensional class group controlling the abelian extensions of x in which some ramification along y is allowed. But it turned out that for the calculations to work, they needed to use the Nisnevich topology. But they really wanted to use the Zewiski topology. So the hope was that the two would be the same. So you can put left uh, Zewiski class group, right side Nisnevich class group, and the conjecture is that Zariski and Nesnevich class group should come inside. And was it with Quillen or, or Milnow? It was with... Ah! Uh, Milnow... So... It, it was with, uh, with they said that you shouldn't use Quillen, but I think I disagree. I think, in fact, you can replace Milnow by Quillen. Yeah, and of course they use the kind of... Uh, they use all the symbolic results on K-theory and study of the filtrations of these pieces which have been developed by Block and Carter. So the result states that uh, at least if I go back to Quillen, then this is an isomorphism periodic, after periodic completion. That's second application. Thank you for the question. Okay, so maybe just one question to finish because we have another lecture we should start okay. with. Okay, just the generation by symbols locally for this risky topology for the Hodge-Bit uh, logarithmic sheet. So does it, do, is there any difficulty with small residue fields or you, you, you can, because uh, usually the... Okay, so there are two steps. First you need to check that it's true for an arbitrary smooth, let's start with the case of a smooth variety. Yeah. The question is whether the logarithmic Hodgewitz sheaves are generated on a smooth variety, is it risky locally by the log force? Yeah, this is true actually for, yeah. In fact, the mean of K-theory sheet is in the risky locally by... Yes, by, by yeah, for this you need this result of Albert Vincent and Müller Stach, in fact, if you want to. Anyway, I can explain the details of the proof. I mean, I explain the details of the proof to you in private afterwards. Yeah, it's a messy proof, but I can explain all the details. Okay, so maybe let's let the speaker.